Hey, y'all, how you doing today? My name is Adam. I'm one of the campus pastors here. I'm so excited to be with you. Today, we're going to be talking about how a group of fishermen became founders of a global movement. But before we get into that, when I was preparing for this message this week, I was listening to a podcast, and the speaker said something that stuck out to me so much, it's been messing with me. He said that if we in Christianity convince people that what they deserve is hell, then they will put up with any kind of spiritual abuse along the way. You can hear, that's one of the most skeptical statements I've heard. And this man grew up in church. He trained to be a pastor. He was a pastor for years and then decided to leave it behind. Because he looked around and he saw Christians that were caught up in politics, that were focused on moral standards rather than Jesus. They were focused on the wrong thing, so he chose to leave it behind. But my heart broke because I thought of this person and just thought, man, if you would only know the point. These fishermen, when you look at the story in John, they leave everything behind in their lives with reckless abuse. Abandon, not because of anything that Jesus says, but I believe because of who he is. Man, faith is not about a standard of morals. Faith is not about a certain set of politics. Faith is not about the religion. It is only about Jesus who is the truth. And he is worth following with reckless abandon in our lives. Here's the story of how the disciples are called in John. It says that the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? (laughs) They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, And you will see. So he went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him, and it was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And look at this. The first thing that Andrew does was go, he goes and he finds his brother Simon and tells him, We have found the Messiah. That is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And I want you to know this, that we can follow with abandon because Jesus is truth. All that Jesus gives to the disciples in this story is a simple invitation. He says, come and see. Jesus looks at John and says, come and see. And then Andrew is so pumped about it that he has to run and find his brother and say, I have found the Messiah. Because there's something that he saw in Jesus that was not only of value, but he found truth. He said, he is the Messiah, and I need to leave my business behind, my friends behind. I don't know why, but he leaves his family behind, and he goes and he follows after Jesus because he is truth. The Greek word for that phrase, come and see, it's exhormai. What it means is to come into being or to come and find your place, and I love that. Because what we're really talking about today is discipleship. We're talking about a simple invitation for connection with Jesus and to grow with him. That's all we're talking about today. And that was powerful enough not just to impact the world, but to literally make a new world. We see the trajectory of the world change around this person of Jesus. So we can follow with abandon because he is truth. But today we have to ask ourselves the question of, is he worth following? Maybe there are some people that came into this room today wondering, really, what are you doing here? Why are we coming to church? Why am I making this effort? Why are we following after this God? If the God that I have pictured in my head only wants to send people to hell, what am I putting myself through? But I don't want you to miss the point. 
There is this person, Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is truth, who loves you and has plans for you that are better than the ones that you have for yourself. He teaches later in John that he says, I have come to give you life to the full. I came to give you life in abundance. So instead of hearing standards, instead of hearing all the things that the church is against, today I want you to hear that there is hope in Jesus and he is inviting you to know him. He is inviting you to grow in him. And he has plans for you that are so much more than what you could imagine today. So Jesus gathers his disciples in John chapter 1. This is their call story. And then we start to track with him through the book of John, and we see him teach miracles. We see his power. We see him start to teach lessons to the disciples. And then there comes this awkward moment when the person that the disciples were following turns to them and says, there's going to be a day that I am no longer with you. Jesus predicts his own death to the the disciples, and then in John, the section that I'm about to take us to, he spends a couple of chapters just offloading what he wants the, the disciples to be about. He's giving them teachings. He's saying in this chapter later that I want you to live this way so that you might prove that you are my disciples, so that you may show the world that you are following me. So we're going to go to John 15 together, and we're going to read through John 15 if you want to turn with me. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, and neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So we can remain with courage because he is life. Jesus gives us this phrase to remain in him. And he gives us this imagery. He says that I am the vine, you are the branches, and my father, he is the gardener that is over all and holds all. And he gives us this imagery to hold on to, to remain in him. This imagery of the vine I hold on to it because Jesus is life. His word says that he will give us life to the fullest. His word says that he is working out all things for our good according to his purpose. And that's not just a verse that we quote so we can feel better. It is a reality I need you to buy into today. That Jesus might actually have plans for your life. That he might actually want to take you on a journey. That as you connect and know with him that he might want to grow you into some things so that you might have life to the fullest. But do we want what he'll give me? Because I think often we can look at Jesus and we can think that he must be withholding something from us. There's all these things in scripture that he tells us not to do or be. Why is Jesus holding things back from me? And I think we're missing the point because the things that he is keeping us from are meant to only protect you And that when you remain in the vine, when you remain in him and you connect and grow in him, there are going to be some things that we need to leave behind because they no longer serve you in the person that he is making you into. But we have to remain in the vine. So he gives us this imagery of pruning. And I want you to know the pruning process might be painful, but it's fruitful. See, he gives us this imagery that he's going to prune back these branches so that those that are there will be even more fruitful in you. And I get this. My wife and I, we just bought a house back in December, and our whole property has only one tree. (laughs) It was right in the front. I mean, we get to look at the river. I don't have it that bad. It's nice. (laughs) But I have one tree. (laughs) And in the front, it has kind of a center trunk, and it splits off to two sides. It's a holly tree. 
The left side is green. You can see the holly leaves. There was enough that we could cut it off and put it around the dinner table at Christmas, and it was nice. Abby's like, we have our own decorations here. This is great. But the right side is all dead. It's all dead branches. And when the spring came, I went up there with the ladder and started cutting it back, the dead branches, giving this tree some kind of hope for making it so it could put its energy into what it's growing into. All the parts of it that has life and fruit, I want it to do more of that and to cut off what is dead so this thing has a fighting chance. But I'm up there and I'm cutting back these branches and at some point there's like hardly any tree left. (laughs) I've cut back so much. And I notice on the dead side there's this sickness that goes up from the base all the way up the right side, this disease on the outside. I noticed that this was a lot worse than I thought. There was this sickness that had so overtaken it that it had cut out any growth this tree was going to have. And when I looked at the left side, I could see some of that sickness had come over to that branch as well. So even though this tree was producing fruit for a time, even though this tree seemed to be healthy and have some kind of life, I realized that its days were numbered. So we cut the whole thing down to the base. But that's why this idea of pruning is so important in this passage. Because there are some habits that might have gotten you through one season. There are some things, some friends that might have been with you in one season. But can I tell you that when you serve my God and you are becoming in him all that he has for you in the vine, there are some things that you need to cut out of your life because they don't serve where God is taking you. There is purpose that you need to lean into, but we have to be willing to trust the process. Do I want what he's going to give me? Is he worth following? And can I trust him that he's going to bring the fruit in my life? Because the more that you remain connected to him, the more you're going to become like him, and the more you're going to want to bring other people to know him. Let's keep going. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So we can remain with faith because he is salvation. This imagery of taking branches and throwing them in the fire, it makes sense to me because What did we do with all those branches that I cut off the holly tree? We had a bonfire for a night, and then it just went up, and that was it. But I don't want you to have this imagery of God and hell today. I don't want you to think God just delights in pulling some people off the vine and throwing them and keeping them in the fire. Instead, what I want you to see is that Jesus came to be with us so much that he loved us. He took that pain and suffering on himself so that we might have life in him. He is our salvation. And so we can have faith now in him that even though when we look around at our lives and it might not look what we imagined it to be if we would just follow him, there looks like a lot more doubt. There looks like a lot more pain. There looks like a lot more messiness. There looks like a lot more addiction. There looks like a lot more struggle. I want you to know that the word says that we can ask what Ever we wish in his name and it will be done for you. And even if in this season it feels like you are waiting, let me tell you today, you can worship while you wait. You can praise him while you wait. He is going to see you through. Because when you are connected to the vine, watch this, our desires become more like his desires. And so the longer that you are walking with him, he's going to change your heart and change you to want more of what he has for you. So that when you ask, it will be given to you because it already aligns with his word and his heart for you and his purpose for you. So we can have faith in him. But if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love 
Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So we can remain with hope because he is life-giving. What I want you to think of in this section is we've been talking about seeing fruit produced in our lives. And whenever you see fruit in this context, I want you to think people. Because what God is doing, yes, he wants to give you success in your business. Yes, he wants to grow your family up. Yes, he wants to give you the desires that are on your heart. But what Jesus shows us in his his example, he calls us to love each other as I have loved you. Jesus wants them to be about people. So then whatever God does in your life and through you, it may be life-giving. That even while we are waiting, he is working for us to be able to reach the people around us to be able to make a difference in their lives. He wants to make fruit that will last. He is setting you up to make a difference because he is the vine. He is life. He is truth. And he wants to invite us that as we remain connected to that vine, that we would bring other people along, that they would only know the truth that we have found, the person that we have found. And we can also remain thankful Because his sacrifice is complete. It says, greater love has no other than this, but to lay down one's life for one's friends. I don't know why in this message, I was texting Theo and Johnny before this, I don't know why in this message I wanted to talk about hell more, but I felt like I needed to, and I don't, I'm usually kind of uncomfortable preaching about it. But I was listening to this podcast, and I think a lot of people often view hell as like God has us in this divine hostage situation. He's like, I made you, but you're sinful and you've fallen, so now I just need you to pray this prayer to be with me. But God hasn't set it up like that. In fact, instead, God stepped in, and he saw where we would go when he made us, and he said, I'm willing to go there with you. And so when Jesus came to earth, when he came dying to love us, to rise again with victory over death and the grave, he did so that he might depopulate hell and populate heaven. He did so that his sacrifice may be complete, that he would bring us with him, that we could live with thankfulness knowing that my God has paid that price in full and that his sacrifice is enough. See, what I want you to hear is the love and the grace that the person of Jesus wants to give you today. It's not going to be found in religion. It's not going to be found in moral standards. It's going to be found in the person of Jesus. And that is enough for us. Because God took this punishment on himself and extinguished it forever so that we may be with him. So we can remain thankful because the sacrifice is complete. And we can remain with anticipation because his promise is eternal. The word says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. I want us to think about people. When you're connected to the vine, when you want to grow in him and you want to introduce other people to know him, we care about the souls of men and women because they are eternal. And so the work that you do to influence the people around you, to love your neighbors, to take care of the people in your life is not in vain. The journey might be long. The time with them might be frustrating. You might not feel like you're seeing any progress or fruit coming. But we can hold on to anticipation because we know that my God is working for my good, that he has plans for me, and we know that he offers life to the fullest. And we know that this work of loving people matters most because the effect is eternal. 
in the life of our church in this season. We do this thing that we're talking about, discipleship, this invitation to connection and to growth. Oh, come on. All right, Marcus is out here. We're g- <laughs> I'm going to take us a bit further, brother, so I'm ready. <laughs> But if we are invited into this relationship with the vine who is life and we want to connect with him, we want to grow in him and we want to bring other people along. How we do this in our church right now is through small groups and through serving. And people grow in different ones, but I want to challenge you to do one or the other. Find your people, surround yourself with people that are fighting through the things that you are encouraging you to stay connected to the vine. Or I want to challenge you to serve, to be able to say, I want other people to know him. So I'm going to give my time to invest and grow with this team to make this environment happen so that someone new might come to know him. And I can't, I wish I could tell you all of the stories for why you should, but I can only tell you right now about what it's meant to me. Some of y'all might remember about two years ago, my wife and I got introduced on the stage to go and be the King George campus pastor. You might be like, why is this man preaching to us here in La Plata then? So we went out, we had 13 people and we saw saw God take it from 13 people to 100 people in about a year. It was awesome, awesome. God is so good in it. And then we were launched for about six months, COVID hit. We had to shut down out of the school. Everything kind of changed. And God started laying it on my heart to come to La Plata. And it didn't really make sense why. I was asking a lot of questions. We were still early in the church plant. Well, I can tell you God did. God provided the person for King George who's running it as a watch party. They're relaunching. They're in the process. God's doing amazing with that. But God put a burden on my heart for La Plata. And I remember in the summer we're doing drive-through prayer and I'm asking God, I need you to show me people that you'll break my heart for. I would need to see your purpose on my life for why we're making this kind of move so I can trust that it is your will and you have something for me here. And man... If I could only tell you the stories of watch party leaders who are influencing their neighborhoods and pastoring their families. If only I could tell you the small group leaders who are fighting for their marriages and fighting for their kids and fighting for their families together. If only I could tell you the production volunteer stories that serve behind the scenes to make this environment happen for us on a Sunday. If only I could tell you the stories of how God has been moving in the middle of a pandemic to change lives and reach hearts. And all I can give you today is that same invitation to come and see. Jesus, that's all he gave to the disciples, an invitation to spend time in his presence because he knew that that would change everything for them. That he was worth recklessly following after him with abandon because Jesus is truth and there's no other foundation that is better to be able to raise your life on than to follow after him. And they would trust that the places that he was going to take them was actually stepping further into their purpose. The places that Jesus would take them would actually change and make a new world. And we have that same power. Later on, after Jesus teaches this, he promises that an advocate would come who would show them greater things than these. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that is living in our lives now. And I want you to know that we can have that same power. There's a teaching that talks not just about heaven coming to earth, but that we as God's people have an opportunity to be heaven on earth. We have a chance to not just make a better world, but make a new world. That when we influence the people around us, when we give our lives to follow him, connected to the vine, reaching other people to show them the truth, that we can actually make heaven on earth. And I want to be part of that. And let me tell you, 
for a season as we were looking at reopening back in February, Johnny, Theo, and I were gathering around and saying, with this new team in La Plata, we want to make sure our hearts are in the right place. If we're going to ask God to move, if we're expecting him to do it again, then we need to be in the right place. So we spent time for a season praying together, asking God for vision, giving us the people, showing us people to bring along on the journey. And y'all, I could not be more excited for what God wants to do through this church, through you as a people, and the stories of people that we can reach and see God change lives on. But we wanna invite you to come and see, find a group, serve on a Sunday, and just imagine what God could do with you because I can only share what God has done in me because of it. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we can feel you in this place. God, would you take this word and allow the things that are not of you to fall away? But God, the things that are of you, would you use it to bear more and more fruit? All across this room, God, there are things in our lives that we need to clear house of. Holy Spirit, would you come and do the work that only you can do? Jesus, you promise us freedom. And so the things in our lives that we feel are too jacked up, we want to submit to you knowing that through the power of the blood of Jesus, they are covered, forgiven, and you can deliver us from it. God, we want to press into your presence, knowing that connected to the vine, to the truth, and the life, that we can have faith, that we can ask whatever we wish, and it will be done for us. So God, invite us in deeper to that. We need it in this place. God, would you speak to our hearts? You are so worthy of our worship and you are worthy of our lives and you have a plan that is so much bigger than us. We just want to be part of it. God, you will see us through.